morning, church. So our theme for today is restoration, and I actually want to use renovation as an interchangeable word with that. So our theme for this kind of month has been restoration, but every time we think of the word restoration, I also want you to think of the word renovation. So when I say restoration, you're going to say? When I say restoration, you're thinking? Exactly. Now, restoration and renovation is a messy business. How many people have renovated their homes or their yards? Hands up. How many of you could do it cleanly? Hands up. There's not very many hands, right? Renovation tends to be a messy business. Now, Ben and I, we are one of the things that we love is we love to renovate. I don't know if you know that about us, but we actually like to renovate things. And we love to, what's one of the things that we love to watch? We don't, we don't actually have TV at home. So when we go to actually a home that has TV and we are given a remote, what is one of the things we love to watch? The renovation shows. Yeah, yeah we do. Like them. There's, uh, you know, when they get a house and they're going to, what they call flipping it, yeah, you flip know, the house. change a house completely, right? So one of the things that we love to do is when there's a renovation, a restoration, renovation. And so we love seeing the before shots when something's really messy and junky and you just go, wow, that looks pretty tragic. And then it becomes like a, woo, that looks pretty cool. So, but we have some of our own renovation stories and it doesn't always go well, does it? Well, see, I'm a mechanical, you know, practical sort of person. I see things that structurally have to be strong, right? But I'm married to an arty. <laughs> and so... As much as I'm trying to construct thing, something strong, she's trying to make it look pretty at the same time. Yep. And I say that causes conflict. It does. It does. Not just a little bit of conflict. Only short, not too long ago, mm -hmm. I put a wall panel in this building that I'm constructing at the moment. And in this wall panel, I just, I nailed this piece of a timber plywood there. And I thought when you walk in the door, I'm going to put a PowerPoint there and a little USB point there. So when you walk in, you can plug things in and then put it on the table, like your phone and other things. To me, that's practical. All right. <laughs> I just finished connecting and even putting the wall plate on for the PowerPoint and the others. And I had it looking good. And I said, Helen, what do you think? I said, that looks terrible. <laughs> I said, you can't have like, just imagine this. Okay. You've heard Ben's side of the story. Now hear my side of the story. It's right near where you walk in. It's like the main door. And when you turn around, you see a beautiful door, a beautiful window and a light PowerPoint, a double PowerPoint, a double USB, all right next to the door handle. And I'm just like going, no, 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 no. But when you walk in the door, you can just plug it in and just put it right there and but, get on with no, your wait, stuff. Wait, wait, wait. There's a reason why PowerPoints are down low so you don't see them. <laughs> so anyway, I told him so that I anyway, thought it was ugly. <laughs> so anyway, I had to pull them all off again. Drill down inside, say a few words that were not very nice and put them down lower so she can have a kitchen bench above it. He did. And then I, but to be fair, then I did the patch job because where the holes are, I patched them up, which took me most of the rest of the day because I figured I was the one who said I wasn't very happy. So I should be the one that patches it up. Now, that goes one way, but it also goes the other way. So Ben does like to construct things and it's often just Ben and I, and often he'll say, I need you to hold this. Mm. You understand where I'm going? Can we just have a look at a little bit of the difference in height here? 
Okay, now there's also a little bit of difference in muscle. I don't think that I'm a complete weakling, but there's a little bit different in muscle. And he'll say, just hold this. And he's asking me to hold this massive beam while he unscrews it or screws it. I'm like, are you sure that this is gonna be okay? And he'll say, yeah, no problems, no problem. I say, is anything gonna drop on my head? No, no, you'll be fine. And then what happens? Sometimes things happen which I didn't expect. And things fall on my head, All right? So what we want you to understand is restoration and can be a messy business. And arguments. Yeah, sometimes. And so today we want to talk about restoration and I want to say it from this point of view. Yes, restoration and renovation, thank you. And that it's hope filled waiting. It's hope filled waiting because when we start some kind of restoration plan, some kind of renovation plan, right? It's not going to happen instantly. Now, one of Ben and I's other little kind of tensions is that we've been building a little cabin with our family, with our kids. We only did the frame and I'm already imagining the furniture and the curtains and where things are going to go, right? Or we just start clearing a place and I'm already imagining the plants that are going to go in and we haven't even put the fence up yet. Now, I want things to happen. No, I'm not very good at clicking, but you can do it better. Go. That's it. I want things to happen like that quickly. And yet the truth is that most restorations, most renovations actually take time. But God has a heart of restoration. God's heart is for restoration for his people and for this world. Now, Ben and I have been sharing and bantering a little bit about who we are and some of the things that we like. And you've seen the set for this morning, right? This goes so against my grain because ask any of the staff particularly, but I go up to the mission center and I'm straightening the cushions and watering the plants and putting things back. And I come here and I want to make sure that the cupboard doors are closed and everything is where it belongs. So to come here in my daggy work clothes, although the redeeming feature is my sparkly gumboots, and have mess on the stage is not what I want. But I want you to understand one thing and keep this in the back of your mind, that when God is doing restoration, when God is doing a, a renovation, it gets messy sometimes. And the best place that God wants to do his restoration and renovation is in his church. So we don't like mess. And we sometimes want to pretend that it doesn't exist. And we don't want people to see it. You know, how many of you have a drawer or a cupboard where when people come, you quickly open it and shove everything in and close it? Yep, we do, right? Some of, some of us just say they have a whole house like that. That's fine. Let's go with that. But what I'm saying is that we don't often like mess. I don't like mess. But when I'm creative, I am so messy. I don't understand it. I'm a bit of a neat freak, but when I cook, there is stuff everywhere. When I'm painting, this is why Pat made me these beautiful coveralls, because somehow the simplest paint project and I have paint in my hair all over my being. But God is the same. When God is doing amazing designs and amazing restorations, sometimes things get messy. Now, Hannah spoke about one of these verses last week and she was reading from Amos 9 and it says, all the sinners amongst my people will die by the sword and all those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. Israel's restoration is the heading. And then, this is my little italics, but wait for it then. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. 
I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. Now, we like the second half of that chapter. But did you see the bit that comes before it? Disaster. There is disaster before the restoration and the repairing. And if you think that that's an isolated verse, well, guess what? It's not. In Isaiah 57, it says, this is God again speaking. It says, I punished them and hid my face in anger, yet they kept on in their willful ways. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. Again, first there's this punishment, there's almost this judgment, and then there's the but, but I will heal them, but I will guide them, but I will restore them, but I will give them comfort. And Fiona already had this verse, and it's part of my passage as well. Verse 10 of 1 Peter 5, And the God of all grace who called you his, to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore, renovate you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. There's the got to be the messy bit. Have you heard the phrase, sometimes you need to get in a mess to get out of a mess? Have you ever tried to clean, do a spring clean and somehow you end up messier than what you originally started and it has to be like that until you can actually pack things away. How many people have a plastic drawer and you decide to go through it and clean it all up and everything is everywhere and you just go, I was supposed to be making this better, not worse. And if any one of you has experienced or witnessed or seen a child coming into this world, that is seriously messy. It is beautiful. It is exquisitely beautiful. It's profound, but it is messy and it's painful. But after that, you have this brand new life. You see, I think that even in our Christian understanding, we love the happily ever after. But we don't like what goes before it. We don't like the dragons. We don't like the, the stepmothers and the ugly sisters. We don't like the having to traverse through the, you know, I'm thinking of princess brides. We have to go through the dungeons and the rats and the fire, exploding fire things, right? We don't want that part of the story. We just want the happily ever after. But in God's economy, so often he allows a messy season to happen before God brings his restoration. He allows the suffering before the healing. He allows the judgment before the forgiveness and the new state of stepping into God's design. Let's look at a couple of Psalms. It says, listen to my words, Lord, and consider my lament. And this is from David in Psalm 5. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and I wait expectantly. That is a cry to God because things are not good. Things are not well. They are not as they should be. And then in Psalm 27, it says, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my saviour. But I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You know, David wrote these Psalms even though he had been what? He had been appointed and anointed to be the king of Israel. But where was he? He was running for his life and hiding in a cave. His life was seriously messy. He didn't have any of the modern formulas, well, you know, modern cons back then, even then, his palace was way better than a cave. He didn't have servants. He didn't have all the luxuries of the palace. Instead, he had a cave. And yet he knew what God had spoken over him. He knew what God had declared over his life. But his life was a mess. And so he cries out to God and he says, God, you know who I am. You know what you've called me to be. And so I'm waiting expectantly for you, my God. There's a series of psalms and they're called Songs of Ascents, which means to come up out of the valley, to speak these psalms as you come up out of the valley. And it says, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. And then it says this, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. You know, when they're going up to Jerusalem, they're coming from below sea level to above sea level, from 400 metres below sea level to 700 metres above sea level. That's a long trek out of a valley to the heights. And this is one of the Psalms that they are declaring, Lord, hear my cry. Out of the depths I cry to you. I wait, my whole being waits for you. I put my hope in you. The problem is, we're not very good at waiting, or at least I'm not. I'm incredibly impatient. I am selfish, I'm impatient, and I don't like God's timing. But God tells us, don't give up and wait on God's timing. How many of you have done an all-nighter? You've put an all-nighter in because you've had to drive somewhere or you've had an exam and you are waiting for those morning rays to say, it's time to submit the assignment, that you're finally there. That I'm waiting more than watchmen wait for the morning. That desire to wait, that's how we need to be waiting for God. And I think sometimes that we, our life is so messy. All this stuff on stage, all these props and cleaning and renovation stuff, we get surrounded by the mess and we get apathetic and think maybe it's never going to happen. Maybe God's not going to fulfill the things that he has spoken. But God calls us never to give up. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, 
Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. That little video clip gives us a pictorial understanding of that parable that Jesus told about the ten bridesmaids, the ten virgins waiting with their lamps, waiting for the bridegroom to come. Now those tiny little lamps, they don't hold a lot of oil and they only would last for a short amount of time. And five of them were wise and bought extra oil because they did not know how long they would wait for the bridegroom to come. And five were foolish. Perhaps they'd given up. Perhaps they thought if God doesn't come, if the bridegroom doesn't come by a certain amount of time, we're not interested. I don't really know. But the reason that Jesus is sharing this story is because he wants us not to give up. He wants us to be prepared and no matter how long we wait for the promise of the bridegroom, no matter how long we wait for the restoration and the renovation that comes through Jesus Christ, we can't give up. We need to wait expectantly, but we also need to be ready to move when God does. Some of you might like chicken noodle soup. There's a lot of mushy stuff in a can. Personally, I prefer the stuff that's made from scratch. But what about caterpillar soup? How would you feel about caterpillar soup? Not very interesting, right? And not something that would be on our diet. But do you know that's exactly what happens to a caterpillar when it goes into a chrysalis or a cocoon? It becomes mush. It becomes a messy soup. It almost completely disintegrates except for a few what they call imaginal discs. And these are the only things that are left of that caterpillar that are the structural work to make the beginnings of a butterfly. In other words, sometimes something needs to be completely deconstructed to remake something new. And then again, there is the waiting process, just like the parable. These caterpillars must be in their cocoon or their chrysalis for 15, 25 days, sometimes up to three years waiting for the right kind of climate, the right environment to unfold before they come out of their cocoon. That is a long time. Three, up to three years. That's an incredibly long time. That's enough. Pardon? It's enough. Um, I'm in the middle of something right now. <laughs> no, no, it's enough. Enough what? You got to change. I beg your pardon. I have to change. You have to change. It's enough. I, I don't, I don't want to change. No, you need to change. I'm really comfortable in no, no. this. Enough. But this is... This is what I know. I'm comfortable in my... Enough. Okay, okay. Change. But this is my sin Stop. and my fear and Stop. my doubt Stop. and... Stop. Change. It's really hard to get out of this. Do you know how hard it is to get out Stop. of this? Change. Oh. I can't. You're going to have to help me. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. One arm, two arms, two arms. Wait, wait, my gum boots. Oh, I have to take off my gum boots. I love my gum boots. 
Was this enough? Can we no. just stop there? Change. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> Oh, that was so messy though. And everybody was watching. How embarrassing. That is what should be happening in our church all the time. That people are prepared to shed their sin, their fear, and their anxiety and step into the fullness of who God has called and destined them to be and do it when he says it's time. No matter how messy it looks, no matter how painful it might be, and no matter who is watching on, so often we are scared to change because of who is around us. So often we are scared to reveal who we truly are who God has called us to be. But God is calling us to be part of his beautiful creation, to shed our layer of comfortable sin, our comfortable fear, and our comfortable unbelief and anxiety and step into all that he's called us to be. What about God's restoration for you? God calls you to examine your life and your heart. You don't know what God's plan is for you unless you begin to look at your life and you do it through honest eyes. And you need to ask for God's revelation. That's point number two. Number one, examine your life and heart. Number two, ask for God's revelation. And number three, then step into where do you actually need restoration? Now, at our women's thing, we talked about some people love flow charts. What are those things called? Excel spreadsheets. Spreadsheets. Who loves spreadsheets? Oh, I love you people because I can't do them. <laughs> But you know what? I can't do spreadsheets, but I can give you a pretty little diagram. <laughs> and so this is it. Examination leads to revelation, which leads to restoration. And notice that it's an ongoing circle. You don't do it once. You don't go, well, God started a process in me. I had a little bit of revelation. I had a little bit of restoration. Let's just stop there. Thank you very much. Ben really wants to do that at Sleepy Hollow, by the way, but I keep thinking of new things that we can do. I'm not really sure that he's happy about that. But really, that's how it should be with us as well. We examine our life. We ask God to reveal what's going on, and then we ask God to restore what needs to be restored. Examination, revelation, restoration. And it's a cycle again and again and again. Don't get stuck. God's restoration for you. Examine your heart and surrender to God. God's plans are so much better than yours. Benjamin, sometimes my ideas for where things go are better than yours too. But sometimes your ideas of how things should be strong is better than mine. So it works both ways. One, examine your heart and surrender to God. Number two, trust God's plan, his plan. If he can create a beautiful butterfly out of caterpillar soup, imagine what he can do with your life. If you trust him, if you're prepared for things to get a bit messy like this, and still trust him anyway. And number three, trust God's timing, his timing, even when you have to wait and wait and wait, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Trust God's timing, his timing. Number four, embrace change, even when it's hard and it's messy. Because you know what? You can't have restoration, you can't have renovation without it being hard and messy sometimes. And so if we want the change, we also have to embrace that it's sometimes going to be hard and messy. 
And number five, wait patiently, but be ready for him. We need to be ready, ready for God to move, ready for God to fulfill his promises, ready for God to come back. Let's not get apathetic in the waiting. Let's not miss out on what God has for us because we were waiting so long we thought it wasn't going to happen. And just like those foolish bridesmaids, we miss out. I want you to ask, I want you to pause for a moment and say, God, where am I in all of this? Where do I need your restoration? What do I need to examine in my own life? You know, so often, I don't know about you, but I'm quick to see where other people need to change or where I think they need to change. But when God puts his finger on my heart, oof, that's a little bit harder to deal with. How many of us have our preconceived ideas of how our life should be rather than surrendering to the one who destined us, the one who designed us, the one who created us, that from the beginning of time, Psalm 139, before your days came to be, I knew them all. That's the plan we have to follow. So people, church, I'm challenging you, but I'm also encouraging you God is a God of restoration. God is a God of renovation. And let him bring his restoration and his renovation and his hope to you, no matter how messy it gets. We love happily ever after, and guess what? We get one. We all get one if we believe in Jesus. If we truly love him, we get a happily ever after. We get eternity with Jesus Christ. But the bit of the story that goes before that can be a bit messy. The bit of the story that happens before that cannot always be a lot of fun. But let's be like those, those wonderful bridesmaids, those virgins with the lamps, and that we are ready, that we are waiting for all that God has for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to come before you. And so often we have a preconceived idea of how church should be, how someone who's preaching should look. We have a preconceived idea of the people around us and what they need to do to address their issues. And we even have a preconceived idea of what our life should look like. But God, if we hold on to those things and fail to see what you're trying and striving and desiring to do, then we are blinded. We've fallen asleep. So God, open our eyes. Help us to examine our own hearts and our own lives. Help us to seek you out for your restoration plan by bringing your revelation to us. God, help us to this week ask for your examination, your revelation and your restoration without fear, without anxiety, without hardening our own hearts and being prepared to fully step into your restoration plan for us. We pray this in your name. Amen.